Whoa. Bienvenidos. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Up to Speed Live. Happy Friday. And I'm Diana Alvear in a place that you don't normally see me in. It's my first time at one of our Verizon stores in the Big Apple. So listen, it is so good to be here on this last day of Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'm super excited. We have a very special guest here today. But before we tell you who it is, if you're on Twitter, by the way, you know who it is. We're going to recap the week. So Monday, we celebrated International Day of the Girl, launching our women's collab in partnership with so many great companies supporting women in the workplace. And I love being a part of it. Tuesday, our favorite brothers, the Ardeans, finished their walk. Can you believe it? They walked all the way across America. They were live. We were live as they made it to San Francisco. They took seven months and 12 pairs of shoes in support of small business. Amazing. And yesterday, Craig gave us an update on our COVID-19 policies. All right, so here we are. It's Fun Friday. It is my pleasure to look back on such an important month for our Latinx community, of which y'all know that I am a very proud member, and invite Diego Stati to the conversation. Okay, oh, hey, Diego, eres argentino, my favorite uh -huh. argentino, next to Andres Cantor. And I know that your culture is so important to you. So on this last day of Hispanic Heritage Month, dígame, what is your message to our Latinx V-teamers, especially our friends at Somos? Well, for, first of all, a big, big virtual hug to everybody on the uh, Latinx community at Verizon, but everybody as well. You can see my huge smile, but through the mask, <laughs> you can feel my huge smile. I'm so happy to be here. And I tell you, it, 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 Hispanic Heritage Month is one of my favorite times of the year mm -hmm. because it's when our culture really gets celebrated mm -hmm. and really comes to the forefront. And listen, as an Argentine, I've been now uh, living in the U.S. Uh, half of my life. Uh, and, and I tell you, there's no one day that goes by that I don't bring to work that authentic self, which is everything that is about, you know, being, being, being a, a, a Latino in this, in this, in this country. And it's an, a, an, a, an amazing privilege to be able to combine your culture with the culture of this country and get even better every day because of that, you know? I agree. And, you know, we got to take a moment and just shout out Somos again. I know that Yes. So well, nice. you see, I, for all of the Somos members out there, thank you for everything that you do because you keep our culture uh, vibrant and that diversity is what makes our company better and, 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 and most exciting place to work, if you, if you think about it. So yeah, for all the Latinos, un saludo muy grande para todos. Y tú sabes, we, we can turn the conversation and talk about el poder of, of the Latinx consumer market. I mean, people are buying stuff, we're super loyal. Tell me about how we're doing with the Hispanic community. Well, for, first of all, a, a huge shout out to uh, everyone in our uh, marketing, uh, product, and business groups that are driving now our strategy to grow uh, the Hispanic market. Listen, I'm not going to tell you anything that we don't know. The Hispanic market is a huge uh, force uh, for our economy. So we have to be there uh, to capture that uh, for the company. And we're doing a great job. And I'm going to tell you uh, a, a secret. When you think about right now about the consumer business, the main driver of acquisition of new customers is the Hispanic segment. So that shows you how important it is. And again, to Javier and everybody that is there driving this work, many, many congratulations. Great work, great work. Sí, Javier es un chileno como mí. Un chileno y argentinos y chilenos, you know, but you know, we get along and we make it happen. At work, we make it hurt work, Exactly. Right? Okay, well, you recently did the keynote address at Ad Color, such an important convention. So much to be proud of when it comes to DEI. Let's talk. Yeah, I tell you, uh, it was uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and we shared uh, the work and the milestones on diversity, equity and inclusion. And of course, there's so much work go going on in the company. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about marketing, we did something really, really special a few years ago, which is creating the responsible marketing action plan. That is four uh, areas in which we're making uh, a lot of progress around the whole marketing ecosystem, ecosystem. The first one is attracting and retaining diverse talent. And I tell you, when I think about marketing, half of the people that work in marketing at Verizon are on our external agencies, advertising agencies, mm -hmm. for example. So we have to make sure that they are also as diverse as we are internally at Verizon. Yep. So when I look at attracting and retaining talent, I tell you, so proud of these results. People of color, 
make 38% of the Verizon marketing and agency teams, which is uh, a, a, similar to the benchmark of the US Census. And women make 51% of the Verizon marketing and agency team, which is exceeding, obviously, the 47%. That doesn't happen by accident. Well, it requires, it requires intention. Mm -hmm. It requires the work of so many leaders in our marketing and agency teams that now every quarter we, may, we, we meet to review our progress. And I tell you, it make, what it makes me even more proud is that even during the uh, uh, difficult times of the pandemic, when I look at new hires in the, uh, uh, so far this year, 49% of the new hires were people of color. Wow. And 59% were female. Woohoo! So we need, we need this diversity. Yes. And Ad Fellows, you heard me before talking about Ad Fellows, it's now in its fifth class and has become the preeminent internship program in the industry. We have 17 agencies that participate, five brand partners, including uh, American Express, Anheuser-Busch, uh, Walmart. Uh, this is a program that Verizon created as not only making an impact for Verizon, but also for the industry as a whole. I tell you, in these five uh, classes, 134 diverse individuals have now grown their careers and getting paid for it because of this program. So tremendous progress. Yeah, and I have to say a word about Ad Fellows because I'm a big fan. I worked with Chase Campbell, I worked with Marcos Bastrochi, uh, a bunch of them who are just so excited to be there, so ready to give of themselves. They're talented, they're smart. And this opportunity came from this program. They're never gonna forget that. So that's 134 lives yes. touched by that. And all uh, people of color mm -hmm. and female. So, so we're really addressing this, this big problem of diversity. The second area is creating a diverse supply chain. And we're doing this as a company as a whole, but in marketing, we promise to spend 30% of our production budget, you know, producing uh, commercials, photography, et cetera, with diverse suppliers. And we're already hitting 50%. So tremendous progress. 56% of our video spend is with diverse suppliers, 45% of our experiential marketing spend, and 50% of our print spend. Wow. So that means that we are supporting diverse suppliers in the right way. And then Verizon, was the first company in the country to run the, the first Black-Owned Media Summit. We brought Huge. a hu whole bunch Huge. of like, thank you, uh, uh, media companies together that are owned by black uh, uh, people to, to help them figure out how to better work with Verizon, mm -hmm. but also how to grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. And we have targets to uh, invest more uh, to uh, support these companies in the, in the future. The third area, is eliminating bias in our creative. And I tell you, we've been tracking the accurate portrayals of women and girls in our work, creative work, commercials, et cetera, since 2016, using a, 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 what we call the gender equality measure. And I tell you, according to our latest report, Verizon's scoring across uh, all metrics above average uh, to, to make sure that we do this in the right in the right way, you know, and we're now using also a cultural insights impact measure to ensure that all of our commercials uh, portray uh, diverse communities in the right in the right way. Wow. And the last area, because bias is very important, you know, mm -hmm. this is something that yeah. we want to make sure that everybody sees themselves in our uh, creative work. So it's very very important. Mm -hmm. And the last area is creating responsible uh, content policies. It's great to have intentions, mm -hmm. but when you put rules in place, things happen. So we achieve 100% participation for both internal Verizon and agency teams on our anti-bias training, but we're also strengthening our brand safety standards and prohibitions against harassment, hate speech, privacy, misinformation, and, and, and fraud. So if any co media company wants to do business with Verizon and wants their money, you have to uphold yourself to do import, important roles. Otherwise, you can't work with Verizon. That matters, you know? It does, and you know, I took the anti-bias training, and I mean, I am a Latina woman who has been in the professional realm for years, I'm not gonna tell you how many, and <laughs> I learned new things. I thought, oh wow, these are, this is a different perspective, this is a different way to look at things. That training is so crucial. Listen, I always think uh, everything starts with awareness. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we all don't, don't know right. sometimes everything that happens. So being uh, more aware, being paying a little more attention, and we in marketing, we have the responsibility to, to even do better yeah. because uh, we, we are portraying our company. And listen, I always say the same thing. We have a company that has 150 million customers. Our marketing teams should reflect the diversity yes. of our Amen. customer base if we want to make sure that we are uh, delivering for them. So it's not only the right thing to do, uh, the diversity, but it's good for business. That's why it's so important for Verizon. And the proof is in the numbers. Exactly. So a, a huge thanks to everybody on the marketing teams that are driving these amazing results and obviously all the work that the company is doing because we wouldn't be able to do this without uh, yeah. the strong commitment of uh, Hans and the VLC. And the DEI team and everybody. Absolutely. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit. I, I have our CMO here, so I'm not letting you go until we talk about the huddle was just fire. I mean, literally, oh the emojis God, were everywhere. Oh my God, that was incredible, right? It was yeah. incredible. Yeah, but I think that it really set us on the right path. And I want to know, because I know that you're a passionate man, especially about all things Verizon, how are we going to keep this going? How are we going to finish strong? Like, what is the secret sauce here to finishing the year strong? Well, I tell you, f first of all, what I always talk about is that it's important that we know who we are, mm -hmm. right? And that we're confident about who we are. And I tell you, everybody can say that they're the best. Mm -hmm. Everybody can say that they have the best network. Everybody can say that maybe you are the ant carrier. But listen, we are the ones that, if I've had to define us, we probably, instead of the ant carrier, we are the app carrier, there you go. right? Because, because we're taking everything that uh, is the standard in our industry and we make it better and then we make it accessible to everybody I, I'm it's so great to be in the store we're just mm -hmm. talking with some some customers that they're saying you know what when I pay at Verizon I know that I'm gonna get quality I know that I'm gonna get the best that's why we're saying to America everyone deserves better it's time for everybody to be a Verizon customer because everybody can have the quality I don't know if you knew but you can get an amazing uh, Verizon experience starting at $35, right? That's what That's we're saying everyone deserves better. So yes. this is the time to get a Ver be become a Verizon customer. And I know that you love uh, Kate McKinnon. Yeah. I know that everybody loves Kate McKinnon. Yeah. And she's been a tremendous uh, uh, asset for us to tell our story. Uh, we are now running our uh, new campaign that tells the story about how Verizon takes a pain point in the industry makes it better, and one of those is like, I don't know if you knew, but we have seven entertainment options Bam. that our customers can pick from. While others give you one, we give you seven. So let's watch, let's you wanna watch it? it? Let's do let's it. Let's take a look. Some carriers will give you just one measly entertainment subscription. One is no fun. With Verizon, there's up to seven entertainment subscriptions with your unlimited plan. That's seven times the, <laughs> Seven times the. No, no. Seven times the. Yes. Yes. Music, gaming, Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus, and more. That's seven times the entertainment. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just thirty-five dollars, better costs less than you think. Okay, so again, I just I adore Kate McKinnon. How did you decide on her? Because that was such a str I love it. I love watching. I'll watch her in anything. Well, listen, she is just a, a, an, an amazing uh, comedian. And, and you know, when you, you have to tell our story, we're looking for ways that uh, are going to be engaging, mm -hmm. interesting, and, and she's doing an amazing job helping us tell that story. But most importantly, again, I want everybody to get connected with this idea that the way we close the quarter and the year strong is by making sure that we're making our numbers, number one, I know that. But number two is believing in ourselves. There's nothing more important for any company to, to believe on who we are, to believe in the power of this brand, to believe in the power of our people and make it happen. We have all the tools to do it. I think that was the, the main conclusion of the, of, the, of the huddle. And we have a tremendous brand that is going to drive us into 2021, 2022 with a tremendous success. So I'm, I'm bullish because we know who we are and we can make this happen. And it's like the perfect segue, right? Because Diego, you know it's Employee Appreciation Week, especially yes. for our retail friends. Yes. So, palabras for them? Listen, uh, this is a, an, an amazing brand, but most importantly, what, who makes the brand is the people. 
that uh, make things happen in, in the brand. And I tell you, I could have been more impressed every day. I'm so impressed with the passion of our people to make things happen and to kind of like bring it all the way back to yeah. where we started. They're the experts. When we talked about, exactly, they know, and they know our customers. So, so you know, it's always, a, I always think like the, the best way to know this business is to come to the store mm -hmm. and talk to the people that save our customers every, every day. But most importantly, I just wanted to say a huge thanks again to Somos mm -hmm. for all the work that you guys do, going back to the beginning of the conversation, and the Latinx community, everybody that uh, help us uh, connect with this audience, pero más, mucho más importante el, el apoyo que ustedes ofrecen para que esta compañía tenga la diversidad que se necesita. So thank you, thank you for the Spanish. Yeah. I love being here with you as always. Y gracias por ser un líder tan poderoso para la comunidad. You know what I mean? It's, it's important. You, you said it yourself earlier. You have to see it to be it. So when we look at a company like Verizon and we see un argentino who's the CMO, you say, I could do that someday. And that's an important thing to, to note here. Listen, for all of you out there that sometimes think that you can't do it, just look at all of the examples around you, but most importantly, that uh, when you work hard, when you put your heart into it, and, and we Latinos, we have a lot of heart, <laughs> anything, anything can happen. So never, never give up and let's work together to make it happen for the company and for, for our country that they need us, you know? Yeah, we got a lot of heart and a lot of spice. Exactly, yeah. but let's do it. Muchas gracias. <laughs> gracias, gracias. Un Happy Hispanic ser. Heritage Month. Uh, all right, and I mean, you heard it here first. This is really great stuff that we're doing today. And it was super important to us to come out to a store. It was Diego's idea <laughs> to go to a store because we want to show you that we are out here. We are doing the thing, right? We are helping customers and we're making things happen. And we're doing it while celebrating our beautiful Latinx culture. So thank you so much. And again, we're gonna plug Somos one more time. You can click the link in today's script if you wanna join. You don't even have to be Latino or Latina to do it, okay? If you're just really into it, you'll learn so much. Finally, we can't close out the month without telling you about Verizon teaming up with Pandora El Pulso, the music streaming service's number one Latin hit station to be part of the Pandora Live virtual concert. In addition to what was an electrifying performance, Verizon hosted a virtual fan chat, allowing viewers to chat with their fellow fans in real time. And our Verizon Live photo booth gave them the chance to take selfies and share them on social media. So there you go, just a month chock full of really great things. So let's talk some business here. So we've got mandatory 10-digit dialing coming. It's a friendly reminder of this important change. So this is happening in July of next year. You're gonna be able to dial 988, just three digits to reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. But for that to happen, all wireless and landline customers at 82 area codes across 36 states will have to include the area code on all local calls for mandatory 10-digit dialing. And that starts October 24th. That is nine days from now, okay? If you're watching this on Friday the 15th. So, what does this mean for you? If you have any numbers pre-programmed in your phone, fax machine, or any other device, they must now include the area code. That means 10 digits. You wanna think about life safety systems, medical monitoring devices, fax machines, internet dial-up numbers, alarms, security systems, speed dialers, mobile cordless phone contact lists, call forwarding settings, voicemail services, and more. Whew, okay? Anything and everything you that use a phone. You, you should it. also make sure that 10 digit numbers appear in contact info on personal and business materials, including websites, as well as personal or pet ID tags. Don't forget your best friends. We're gonna keep you posted about these changes through posts on our website and social media platforms, but we have all the essentials about 10 digit dialing, including the list of 82 area codes and frequently asked questions on our website. So you wanna check those out. Okay, so last night, taking more serious turn here. At the National Mall in Washington, D.C., two of our V-teamers, Maggie Hallbuck, VP of Public Sector Sales, and Greg Capetta, Manager of Public Safety Outreach, participated in the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund candlelight vigil. It was beautiful. It annually memorializes officers who die in the line of duty. This event also featured Verizon's communications trailer known as Big Red. This is a massive mobile hub for first responders with 24 individual workspaces, charging stations, laptops, satellite equipment, and more. It's everything that they would need in a disaster and we bring it to them. It is a reminder that while we are a couple of weeks away from the National First Responders Day on October 28th, Verizon's dedication to first responders remains a year round commitment. Turning now to some great news from VBG and Verizon Connect. 16 of our sales employees have been named as finalists in the 2021 European Women in Sales Awards. 
Now, these awards recognize the achievements of women in sales roles. They help to encourage diversity and new talent in the workplace. You know we love that. And of course, it makes companies such as our own stronger and even more successful. More awards news. We're going to let a tweet by Tammy Irwin start us off. She says, the most important key enabler of hybrid work in the future will be how we continue to innovate video collaboration. Incredibly proud of the work the Blue Jeans team has done and continues to do. By the way, Blue Jeans was named a visionary by the 2021 Gartner Magic Quadrant for meeting solutions for the fifth year in a row. And the team continues to innovate, rolling out the two and three dimensional virtual space called Spaces and the virtual collaboration board for ideating and even integrated messaging. These are all vital features for a hybrid working world, the one that we know so well now. So go Blue Jeans team, go. This week, my very scary friend, George Coronias from George Talks Tech, <laughs> walked us through all the awesome new features of the Motorola Edge 5G ultra wideband. And you're gonna be able to tap into C-band spectrum once this device is available. We are talking spooky, super fast downloads, low lag, bigger camera pixels, more powerful processors, faster battery charging, and expanded ready for capabilities. So for more details and of course a few Halloween laughs, click the link in today's story to watch the latest episode of George Talks Tech. All right, store news y'all, good timing because again, it's employee appreciation week for retail. So a new Verizon store has opened in Nashville. Fun fact, the store's general manager, Marquise Anderson, a Nashville native, said his very first job was at a restaurant on 8th Avenue, which is less than a mile away from Verizon's new store in the neighborhood of Melrose. So not only have things come full circle for Marquise in his hometown, he's excited to help Verizon rock it out in Music City. Okay, so before we go, a reminder that right after this episode of Up to See Live, you can catch our closing panel by Somos featuring their sponsor, Ronan Dunn, talking about their experiences as first generation Americans. So thank you so much for hanging with me today. I'm Diana Alvear. I am here still with Diego. Any last words? I mean, send us off into the uh, into, I just want to yeah. like say, I mean, when I see the level of innovation that our business uh, units are creating, I mean, looking at, at BBG, I mean, the, the business group is killing it. Uh, so mm -hmm. congratulations to all. Uh, and again, listen, we have the next uh, few uh, weeks of the year uh, to finish uh, the year strong. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you, the whole yeah. comms team. You guys do an amazing job every day to keep us you all connected. And when we talk about where we are right now, we feel closer than ever because we're more connected than ever. It doesn't matter if you're in person or not, we are closer than ever. And that's what makes a culture and that's what makes a company. You know, so thank you everyone. Great to be here. Thank you, Diana. Give me a Hispanic Heritage high five. Woo! There we go, man. All <laughs> thank right. Thank you. So again, I'm Diana Alvear, but I'm gonna let our Nashville friends do the honors of setting us off. Stay safe, stay connected. From our Melrose store in Nashville, until next time, you're out to see! Well, a very warm hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me here today. You know, over the course of the month, we've enjoyed a, a full-blown program led by our Somos members and other B-teamers dedicated to recognition, education, pride, and unity. And this year's theme, Somos, One Familia, Many Cultures, really perfectly reflects the diversity among the Latinx community while representing the unity over our shared goals and aspirations as a community. Now, as you all know, Somos means we are in Spanish. It's also the name of our employee resource group at Verizon, which is over 4,000 members strong and growing. And I'm incredibly proud to be the executive sponsor of Somos, and I'm especially excited to close off Hispanic Heritage Month by bringing us all together one more time for a truly unique and inspiring conversation with our V-teamers from Somos about their particular journeys as first-generation immigrants and dreamers. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, the U.S. Latinx community is a truly young, vibrant, and growing population. Now, I believe, over 60 million strong. And in fact, it's the fastest growing and the second largest ethnic racial group and one of the most important contributors to the U.S. economy and customer segments. So it's not surprising that the Latino market is vital to Verizon's growth. For example, when it comes to accessing the Internet, mobile devices play a larger role for Hispanic adults. And Hispanics are also moving up and rising above obstacles, their strength, 
hard work and resilience truly amazing. And as Verizon, we're forming strong bonds with the Hispanic community as a service provider, as a philanthropic supporter, and as a policy advocate on important issues, including DACA. Now, Verizon has long stood with dreamers who are crucial contributors and strengthen our communities and our nation. Dreamers are our colleagues, our friends, and our family. We value diversity in all its forms and strive to create an environment where everyone feels they can be their authentic selves, bringing truly the best of themselves to work every single day. And so with me today, I have the privilege of having four guests who represent our Somos Employee Resource Group and who contribute to our Verizon goals and successes every single day. They perform jobs in public policy and talent acquisition, employee engagement and marketing. And they're also first generation immigrants and some are dreamers. So please help me to welcome our guests, Ivana Krishnik, Ulyssa Monroe, Leonardo da Silva and Carlos Arcila. So thank you all for joining us today. And as some of you may know from my funny accent, I'm an immigrant too, and landing in my new home in New Jersey was, was quite an enlightening and illuminating experience because it's a very different world from my home back in Ireland. And I suppose the one thing that I recognized that I missed was that I had to make new family because one familia is such an important thing for so many immigrants. And while the Irish community is huge in America, I left one family at home and I had to make the opportunity to make my new family here in the US. And as we know, there are many paths into the US. And as you will hear from our guests today, none of them are exactly alike. Everyone has a different story. But there are three things our guests share. They all excel in accepting uncertainty, building resilience, and maintaining an overarchingly positive attitude through their journeys. So I'm now going to open up and ask our guests a few questions. And I'm going to start by just asking you the kind of obvious question, what's it like to be a first generation immigrant in the US? And maybe I can start with you, Ivana. Sure. Thank you, Ron. And um, actually, I come from a family of immigrants. My grandparents were from Slovenia. And like many other Europeans at times of wars and famine, they ended up in Argentina. That's where I grew up. My brother and I are both immigrants. While he went to the UK, I came to America. Uh, so more than 20 years ago, I arrived at uh, JFK with uh, two suitcases, no family, no friends, no connections here. Actually, I knew no one when, when I arrived. Uh, but in a way, I was lucky. I arrived here on, on a student visa to attend uh, graduate school. As a first-generation Latina immigrant in America, I would say the challenges have been many, but so have been the opportunities. And, and I want to stress that point. The challenges have been many, but so have been the opportunities. In my professional career, I have met a few people that uh, perhaps uh, judge, judge me as being less qualified because of their own uh, prejudice or stereotypes of being of what is being a Latino or an immigrant. But the majority of my interactions have been positive, And it really feels great to work for a company like Verizon that value our talents. Thank you. Uh, Ulyssa, if I can ask you the same question. Yes, Ronan. So I am from Peru. And um, when I found out I was coming to the United States, it was kind of like a dream come true. And I was like, wow, do I get this chance? However, um, for me, it has been humbling and, and the scariest experience I have ever went through. I came to the U.S. with my brother, thank you to my father, and we arrived in L.A., similar to Ivana. One suitcase, my father said, you don't need anything else. We'll get everything else you need here. And you sort of left your life behind, friends, um, my own mother. And uh, it was one of those moments where you... Felt like I, I cried many nights, like I want to go back. It was the scariest. I didn't speak any English. My father was even a stranger to me because I really never lived with them. And um, I, I learned to just learning the language and um, and push through. So um, I, at moments I felt alone. Um, there was at one point in my life where I had to leave my dad's house for um, different reasons, and um, I went and made a life on my own and. 
that is the moment where I said, okay, I either make it or I just need to do it. Learning English, not knowing a word of English was the scariest thing for me. And, um, but I did it. And I am proud to say that I have taken advantage of the great opportunity that life has given me. And it's just being part of this amazing country. There is so much you can do. And I'm one of the luckiest person there is, I, I will say so. Thank you, Julissa. Leonardo, if I can ask you the same question. Yeah, uh, I came to the U.S. as a five-year-old with my mom and two little brothers. They were uh, two and one at the time. And my dad had already been in the U.S. for a year. And so it was my mom coming from Brazil on a 12, 14-hour flight with three small children coming to a country that she didn't know the language, being at an airport. Um, I remember those little things. And it does make me emotional thinking about the sacrifices my mom made. For us coming, you know, uh, becoming a first generation immigrant. Uh, growing up, I've lived in Salt Lake City my whole life now since I was five, and there wasn't a huge Brazilian or Latino community here. So I've, I've always been stuck between both cultures, you know, and I've gained a accent when I speak in Portuguese. I don't have a uh, accent in English anymore, but I do have one when I speak Portuguese. So I'm not. I don't ever feel like I'm in on both sides, you know, American or Brazilian, because I'm always stuck in between. So that's always been tough. And, you know, being the oldest son, that pressure of becoming that first generation that comes over here is just unique. And it's really tough going through school, going through life uh, with the Latino community. There's all, a lot of pressure on the oldest son. So I would say, you know, being the first generation immigrant, especially in my position, has been always uh it's been difficult, but it's been worth the while. Well, it's interesting. Before I pass to Carlos, I have a 27-year-old daughter who was born and raised in England, but who identifies herself as Irish like her parents. And the first time she was ever English, which uh, strikes me a chord with your comments, Leonardo, was when she arrived in Ireland to go to university. Because of her accent, everybody said, you're an English girl. So exactly the same thing. In the English community, she was Irish. In the Irish community, she was she was English. Carlos, if I could ask you your perspective. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ronan. Yeah, so, you know, like Leonardo, we share very similar uh, backgrounds, right? I came at the age of five. Um, you know, I came to New Jersey. I was raised here, and I came with my mother. My father left me, and then kind of we came and followed, uh, you know, my dad's footprints here to New Jersey, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was very challenging growing up, right, because we were uh, really the only family amongst our neighborhood. And uh, so the challenges were many, um, you know, I think growing up here, it was uh, like a tale of two identities and a tale of two communities. Um, but I would say that I've um, been very fortunate um, to take advantage of all the opportunities that were in front of us. Um, even though we grew up within poverty, I think uh, we had, I had a very loving home. And so I think that that love really carried through and the support mechanism to know that uh, if you could dream uh, and you can work hard, uh, you could achieve it. So that was kind of my background coming from Colombia. Thank you, Carlos. And if I can build on, on this and just ask each of you in turn, what are the unique challenges you've had to overcome in your uh, particular journey? And maybe, Julissa, I, I start with you. Thank you. Uh, challenges were many, but I would say um, the two of them was like not having a family um, to support you that you can call, you can go knock at their door if they're having a hard time. Like, can I talk to you? But the other one that I've had to learn and really taught me to be resilient is learning English. Uh, that was the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. And um, when I came, I was very young, but I was already, I, I believe, 17, 18. You have an accent. And, um, and like when you, were, you pronounce the word stop or stop, and people make fun of you. And for me, it was sometimes I didn't want to talk. Like I just was quiet. I didn't want to tell people I was in the room. Um, but at one point in my life, I was like, I had to grow a thick skin. And, um, and I think it, because of people make fun of me, it made me stronger. And um, I, I said, like, if I don't do this, then I can't help my family. I cannot help myself. And I'll just be here. And I worked hard. And uh, it was interesting. Um, 
story. Like when I met my husband, my husband is here. He's born here. And um, he always tells me, why did you lose your accent? And to me, it was like, I have an accent. He's like, no, you don't anymore. And that's the thing that I liked about you. So when he says that to me, it kind of like brings this warm feeling in me. But I don't think I tell him, like, you don't understand the things that you go through when you have one. And um, but it, it's just being rewarding. But it made me very, very strong going through that frustration uh, part of my life. Thank you. And and also, just before I pass from you, Alyssa, I think that, you know, in those challenges create uh, accomplishments and, you know, whether it be family and other things, I think it's just so important that maybe through adversity, we all create uh, opportunities that uh, ultimately will be defining and, and uh, demonstrate the fact that we really did uh, make a difference in and in a beautiful accent. So, Leonardo, if I if I ask you the same, the challenges and accomplishments of your particular journey. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest challenge that I had to overcome was uh, being undocumented and kind of living in the shadows and, you know, not having the same opportunities as those around me. And uh, growing up, people in my neighborhood, things like that, they, they weren't going through the same things I was going through at home. Uh, learning English as a child, I actually learned English through uh, Sesame Street. Um, you know, watching television, um, you know, I remember early as a kid, I would get made fun of and, you know, the way I dressed and being poor. Um, so overcoming that, um, you know, it's always in the back of your mind. It's uh, somewhat of a, of a traumatic experience going through some of those things that maybe not others are going through and people don't understand. Uh, so, I mean, that was a huge thing to, to overcome, but it, it built, it made me a stronger person than I am today. And, you know, currently I'm going to graduate school. I'm getting my MBA from the University of Utah. I got my undergrad uh, also at the University of Utah, all through uh, the help through Verizon and the tuition reimbursement program. And I think my biggest thing is just giving back to my community and being able to to help those that are going through those uh, same challenges and, you know, just trying to be a part of that community and help those out that are going through the same things that I went through. Thank you. Uh, and it's so important, I think, to to recognize that that challenge of visibility and invisibility and just learning to be in an environment where we can bring our best uh, our best selves. Uh, and, you know, it's so important that the culture inside Verizon uh, recognizes that every single day is a proof point of whether we actually live up to that ambition of really creating a safe environment. And I love things like the tuition reimbursement because for so many people, education is um, a huge opportunity to reset, not just for themselves, but for their own families. And we have talked about this as, uh, you know, one familia, the one thing that culturally I think binds us all is that real sense of, uh, of family. So, Carlos, if I can ask you the same around your, your journey and the challenges and accomplishments. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Rona. I think it was, you know, the challenge of really not being open with my backgrounds, right? So I think with as Le as Leonardo was, right, uh, being undocumented very early on, it was very difficult. Um, you know, we couldn't really share things uh, with other families. I remember growing up where, you know, today I do with my children, where I'm heavily involved with uh, my children's parents. My parents were not as involved uh, then, so you know, it was little things like the birthday parties that we really didn't go to. Um, and then also just the challenge of, you know, always growing up within the public school system, having lunch tickets, for example, a um, bit of discrimination that we went through uh, growing up. But I think that that really built character within us, within me, and, you know, being able to overcome whatever challenge comes in front of us uh, or comes in front of me, um, has really, you know, it, it really built uh, kind of that character part of me, um, overcoming a lot of those challenges. So I would say that adversity that we grew up with, I think uh, it helped me over time accomplish many of the things that um, my parents didn't do, right? My parents never graduated high school. So, you know, going on and getting my MBA with the Verizon tuition program and assistance there was excellent. Um, you know, owning a home today, again, it's, it's kind of that journey that I would have never thought uh, could be possible back when we were, you know, uh, a small kid here in Cliffside. So 
think that the, those were those have been some of those unique challenges that we overcame uh, in my journey. Fantastic, thank you. I'm going to change it up here, and uh, you know, one of the things that undoubtedly uh, attracts people uh, to uh, the U.S. is uh, it's the American dream. It's it's all about that hope, that opportunity uh, to succeed, and it's America's highest aspiration and promise, and it's inextricably bound into the ideals of freedom, equality, justice, and ultimately, and most importantly, opportunity for all. So you all are examples of people who have pursued the American dream. So I'd, I'd love uh, your perspective on that. So, Leo, maybe I'll go back to you. Yeah, I feel like I am the American dream. I embody that every single day. Um, I'm not like uh, I'm just like those people that came here through Ellis Island uh, early on, you know, in the 1900s. Um, you know, I came here, I started cleaning bathrooms. I did jobs people didn't want to do. I, I literally came from the bottom, um, through education and opportunity. I've been able to build myself up and I did, there was, there was a lot of time that I did lose hope. There was those hard days, but I'm here today and, you know, I'm showing people that it's possible to, to, that the American dream is still true and it's real. Um, I'm just the embodiment of it and. I'm just so thankful that I've had the opportunity um, to overcome some of these things. Thank you. Ivana. So um, to me, the American dream means uh, freedom, uh, choice, and equity. I think equal access to opportunities, as Leo was saying, no matter where your starting point in life is. And I think many of the stories that we heard of V teamers during Hispanic Heritage Month exemplify the American dream. And personally, uh, for me as an immigrant, one of my proudest moments was in March 2009 when I became a U.S. citizen. Fantastic. Thank you. Carlos. Yeah, you know, it was, you know, the, the American dream for me was being able to take my father's advice, where it was to work hard um, and, you know, always put in the sweat. And I recall, like, it being at the age of 14, just working again doing those jobs that maybe people didn't want to do uh, but then also sharing that value and, and and kind of having my kids also go through that as well so my kids at 14 they started working as well so it's being able to pass on that legacy on so i think part of the american dream is to be able to look at hope and chase it and be able and have the freedom to be able to chase hope and I think that work ethic is is so important. And I think personally, it's something that I believe defines uh, immigrants, because wherever we leave, and I left home in Ireland 36 years ago and moved first to the UK, but your community expects you to represent them. And the work ethic is 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 one of those. And my mother, who just passed recently at the wonderful age of 92, had a saying which you always used, which is, there's only one way to do things, and that's the right way. So uh, thank you. If I can ask you the same, Julissa, about your experience on the American dream. Yeah, um, like everybody mentioned, the American dream is different for everybody. For me, it's when I was able to buy a home for my mom and my sisters in Peru. And uh, growing up, we didn't have one. We actually lived in my uh, grandparents' home, which I never met, and where all my mothers and sisters and brothers and my cousins, we lived together. We shared rooms, and um, and and when I was able to provide that for my mom and my sisters, which was like amazing. Um, it was also when I was able to bring my mom here and my sisters. My mom came when my daughter was born, and my sisters came like 17 years later, but they did. But the other piece of it is, I've been working for Verizon for 23 years. November 2nd will be 23 officially. But I worked jobs that I never thought I was going to work, starting from answering phones to do marketing. And I would have never thought I will have a job that I love. I love recruiting. And I, I think it's just this, not just this company, but this country gives you opportunities to be able to find something that you really, really love, being part of SOMOS has also been part of my own American dream professionally, being able to give back to employees, have a job that I can provide for my family and continue to help. And I'm currently, I got my bachelor's tuition assistant, like, you know, my peers here. 
And I'm currently going to my master's a little bit later in life, but I have three more classes to go, but I'm still living the American dream and I'm still pursuing it. And I still feel like I have a lot more to do. Fantastic. Well, happy anniversary in advance uh, for November. Um, if I can ask, uh, Carlos and Leo, you both touched on this in your earlier uh, answers, but you have that somewhat unique experience as, uh, as dreamers. So if I can if I can ask you about that challenge of, uh, of uh, as former dreamers of first generation immigrants, uh, what were the unique experiences for you when you were growing up undocumented? So maybe Carlos, I start with you. Yeah, thank you, Ron, for that question. Yeah, it was it was difficult. You know, I think part of it was, you know, with my parents being here, it was serving the role of being an interpreter. Um, I always had to be the advocate for my parents, calling, you know, the insurance to figure out what's next, uh, paying the bills, uh, being the messenger for the family. Um, and, you know, it was it was it was this really unique challenge that I had that no one else really understood. I came here growing up as like an only child. My, my brother came in later, but um, that was a bit challenging. Um, you know, back then I didn't really appreciate being able to speak and, you know, and, and just be fluent in two languages. Today I am. Um, but, you know, I think part of that challenge was really being secretive about this whole thing. Um, until it was a little bit later where I was able to open up a little bit more. Um, but that that really was the the unique challenge that we had. It was just that I had was just to be that interpreter, kind of that advocate for the fan. I think today, um, when I look back, I think that this is why I'm involved so much with like Somos or with our employee resource group, it's to give back. And it's not only that I give back at work, I try to give back even in everyday life. So if I'm in the grocery store and the person in front of me is having trouble, you know, understanding or interpreting, I'll step in and help. But every single day, I'm trying to give in a little bit back to, um, you know, to the community. That's, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Leo, your, your perspective on that is coming in undocumented? Yeah, and I mean, it was a constant thing about being undocumented in my situation. You know, I didn't get proper documentation until I was 28. So, you know, I was pretty much an American growing up. I knew, you know, that's how I felt. And, you know, I remember losing my first job because of that that issue and sitting there crying in somebody's office. And, you know, it's just it's, I still think about it, um, you know, just kind of like Carl was saying, hiding in the shadows and, you know, pretending that you're just like everybody else and you feel like you're everybody else, but you're not. That was always tough for me. You know, at 28, um, I was able to, and I think my life turned around from there. Um, you know, being able to go to school, that was a big opportunity. I always felt like I'm 10 to 12 years behind my peers because I didn't have those same opportunities until I was later in life where I could go to school, where I could get good jobs. You know, I was going in between those jobs that nobody wanted to do. And if I did find a good job, I'd usually lose it. Um, and this is before DACA had, came into place. So my experience as a, as a dreamer was really difficult, um, but I, like I kind of been talking about, it's, it's made me a stronger person. And the biggest thing is I always felt like I was an American. Um, I always felt like I embody that, that kind of American dream that we talked about earlier, but always being undocumented, always being scared, not knowing if I was going to get my license. It always started kind of like from there, not getting my license. Everybody else was getting their license. Uh, yeah. People were getting, going to work. People were at 20 going to uh, have fun, go to parties. And, you know, I was working, helping my parents out and, and paying bills. So um, that experience uh, was difficult, but it, it made me the person I am today. Thank you, Leo. I'm going to jump, respectful of time, I'm going to jump to our our, uh, our last question. And you all have a tremendous experience. And one of the great benefits of having these courageous conversations is, is learning from one another. Look, I have the privilege of being an exec sponsor of this uh, ERG, of which I'm very uh, proud to be to be part of and, and appreciate so much the work that you all do. But if I could ask you just as we as we finish and I'll go to each of you as as ERG leaders, what advice, you know, just one maybe crisp piece of advice would you share with your your fellow uh, V teamers? So Julissa, if I could start with you. I, I will say first, join an ERG and hopefully you choose almost to be one, but be proud of who you are, accent or not push forward, learn, be curious, raise your hands, challenge yourself to new tasks, look for opportunities, tell people what you want. 
take advantage of tuition assistance, all the wonderful benefits that this company provides to you. And um, as an active member, you get opportunities that nobody else probably can have or open doors that you never thought people were going to be open, just being part of an ERG. You find a different family. You find, you grow your family. I can tell you for personal experiences, um, Ronan, just working with you, who would have thought, like never in my wildest dreams, right? So it, for me, it's an accomplishment. And I will say my family has doubled. My work uh, familia in Verizon has doubled. Fantastic. Thank you. Ivana. So I'm I'm not a business person, but as you were saying, Ronan, the Latinx market is one of the fastest growing segments of the American economy and critical to, to Verizon's future. Uh, so I would say to win big in this market, uh, we need to know uh, the Latinx uh, customers' values and culture uh, and needs better than our competitors do. So as an ERG leader, what I would say to our fe uh, fellow V-teamers is that Somos can be your sec secret weapon. We have more than 4,000 uh, members, uh, as you were saying, uh, and looking at Leonardo and Carlos and Julissa, you know, um, full of energy and talent, bicultural, bilingual. And I think we are, you know, we are ready to collaborate and lead Ver Verizon to success in, in this market. Thank you, uh, Carlos. A wise word from you. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. So I would just say, give back to your community, right? Not only through an ERG. Obviously, join an ERG. There's so many benefits. Uh, but always, always be an advocate for those who perhaps can't help themselves, right? Like um, little small things every day um, improves the lives of others, and it'll improve your life. So that would be my my kind of word of encouragement. And the and the last word goes to you, Leo. Thank you. Yeah, I would uh, definitely encourage all our V-teamers to join an ERG. It doesn't have to be Somos. We have a lot of different types of ERGs that are very specific to, to all the markets. Somos has helped me like meet people like Carlos. And, you know, I sometimes always feel like I'm alone in, in these types of things. But you're not alone. And, and ERG and networking and volunteering and those things, you know, it pushes you outside of those boundaries. And I definitely, again, my closing things is join an ERG It'll open a lot of doors for you. Fantastic. And, and look, on a personal note, just thank you all so much for, for sharing and so, sharing so, so richly and so honestly. You know, what comes across to me very clearly is a real pride. And sometimes pride is ultimately built from, from adversity. But uh, in every one of your conversations, there was also not just the pride for yourselves, but about your recognition of your role in your own communities as well. So really inspiring and a, and a much needed conversation. And I hope that all of us who are listening have a better understanding and appreciation for immigrant challenges uh, and will benefit from the advice of our panelists, who, which they shared with us today. So look, as we close out our Hispanic Heritage Month, I would encourage you all to continue learning from each other's uh, stories. Every ethnic community, every immigrant community is all about storytelling. But as we talked about, you know, joining an ERG, whether it's Somos or others, is a really important opportunity. And guess what? Become allies. Even if you don't qualify to be a member of things, become allies. It's such an important thing. Just knowing better is not the same as doing better. Somos, one familiar, many cultures, extends beyond uh, the Latinx community. It's a message uh, for all of us. So, we need to continue to get more comfortable like our guests here today to have those courageous conversations and bring diversity uh, of people and perspective into, into life, challenging our thinking, our motivations, and our understanding so that we really deliver on the great benefits of diversity as some of the first steps to creating an incredibly important thing, which is a workplace, which is for all of us as V-teamers. And to be able to deliver, as Ivana said, better products and services for our customers because of our better understanding of the communities in which we uh, serve. So, again, for me, muchas gracias a todos por compartir su historia. And thank you for joining us uh, today. It's been a real privilege. Thank you. <laughs>